Welcome to Samuel's Weimar Theological Seminary. Today we're looking at the great John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation. In the reign of Edward III, a crowd of the citizens of London were seen on their way to Old St. Paul's, and as they hurried along the narrow streets and collected around the doors of the cathedral, their loud voices and violent actions showed that they were engaged in angry dispute. It was evident that some unusual event had drawn them from their homes so early on that winter's morning. A priest named John Wycliffe was about to appear to answer charges that had been brought against him, and as they gathered into clusters, the accused arrived dressed in plain black robe and with a small round cap on his head. His long grey beard appeared over his breast, and he looked calm as though the tumult of the people awoke in him no fear. And passing through the throng, he entered a small ancient chapel which formed a part of the cathedral, where the bishop and the judges had already taken their seats. The accused was not alone. Two noblemen, clothed in velvet and gold, walked by his side. One of them, the Duke of Lancaster, placed himself on his left hand, and the other Lord Percy stood on his right. And when the Catholic judges saw that the powerful friends who had come to support his course, they were filled with rage, and charged the two noblemen with being enemies to their religion and the king. Provoked by these words, the Duke, in return, threatened the bishop, and soon the whole assembly was in confusion, John Wycliffe standing all the while before his judges without speaking a word. When the people who were at the doors heard the noise within, they cried aloud against the good priest. Then running through the streets to the palace of the Duke of Lancaster, the most beautiful mansion in the kingdom, they began to pull it down. And in their rage they committed murder on a person that was passing near the spot. Those ignorant people had been told by some, what we could say, bad priests, that Wycliffe and his friends intended to destroy the religion of the land. And in their ignorance they were driven to these acts of violence. It was like the scene when the Apostle Paul was at Ephesus and the whole city was filled with confusion because the idol makers who feared they should lose their gains stirred up the people to oppose the preaching of the gospel. Nearly twelve months passed away and Wycliffe once more stood in the same place and before the same judges. There was again a great crowd of people but they were not then crying out against him and demanding that he should be sent to prison. Since the pious priest was last there they had better understood his character and had learned to value his preaching. He was now known to them as the good as the gospel doctor. The people had come to support his cause. They forced their way before the court and demanded that he should not be hurt. The priests were alarmed at what they saw and heard, and though they had hoped to have him condemned, they were glad to let him depart freely to his home. It is asked, what was the crime that brought Wycliffe into such trouble? The answer is, the Pope of Rome had sent three letters, or bulls as they were called, to England one to the bishops and another to the University of Oxford, and a third to the king. In them he charged the humble parson with many serious offences, and he desired that he should be seized and sent to prison there to lie until their orders from Rome. Was he then a teacher of false doctrine, a traitor, or in any other way a wicked and injurious man? No. His offence was that he was an inquirer after truth, and sought to bring the people from under the power of the monks and the friars who led them astray. And it was because of this he thus felt acted that the Pope had resolved. It, it was because of this that the Pope had resolved to try and crush him. There were at this time in England many thousands of parsons called monks and friars, and the monks were those who lived alone or separate from the people. Their houses were called monasteries, or places of retirement, and the term friars signifies brothers. And if these later were the begging friars, who, it is said, swarmed throughout England at this time. They travelled over the land, forcing their way into the houses of the rich and poor, living without any cost and taking all the money they could obtain. Though they assumed poverty, they were not poor in spirit, nor were they meek of the earth. 
like the Pharisees of old, they pretended to be better and holier than others, though their lives were full of evil, and they taught for doctrines the commandments of men, and declared that all who belonged to their order were sure of salvation. And when Wycliffe, Wycliffe saw the conduct of the friars, his heart was much grieved, and the best way to oppose them, he knew, would be to write a book against them, and a book was written in which he called them the pests of society, the enemies of religion, and the promoters of every crime. Angry and annoyed at the exposure, they were ready to help the Pope in the hope of getting the writer sentenced by the judges to the dungeon or to death. Wycliffe, however, continued to write and preach against them, and with so much labour and zeal that his health began to suffer. And one day, lying on his bed, and as it was thought nigh to his end, some of these friars made their way into his room. And they rushed to his couch, began to upbraid him for what he had done, and called on him to express his sorrow before he died. For some time he heard them in silence, then desiring his servants to raise him up, he cried aloud, I shall not die but live, and shall again declare the evil deeds of the friars. Alarmed at his courage, they fled in haste from the room. And when Wycliffe got well, he retired to the little market town in Leicestershire, of which he was the priest. And in this place he entered on his great work, that of translating the Bible into the English language as it was then spoken. To give the people the word of God was the best way of fulfilling his threat against the friars. He knew that the Bible was God's great gift to the whole human family. Why then should not his countrymen possess it? To give it to them would be something worth living for, and so he diligently set about his task. It was a long and difficult work to undertake, but faith and love carried him through it, and the word of God was precious to his own soul, and he knew that what he had been blessed that what had been a blessing to himself could be made a blessing to thousands. So onward he went in his work with prayer and patience, and as he went along he found instruction and comfort for himself while he was providing while he was providing for the spiritual good of others. Year after year he saw the fruits of his study increase. One page, then another were done, until at length in the year 1380, the last verse of the New Testament was translated, and the Bible completed in its English dress. We may think we, we see him looking upon the pile of writing he had made, then falling on his knees to give God thanks, imploring him to bless the truth of the, to the souls of the people. All books in those days were very scarce and costly, for the art of printing was not then known, and before the year 1300 the library of the University of Oxford consisted only of a few tracts chained or kept in chest in the choir of St Mary's Church. Copies of all books were made in writing, and as this was a slow and careful work, it took several months for one person to write a complete Bible. How different it is now, when a printing machine will produce 15 to 20 copies of the Bible every few minutes a thousand thousands every year and then as to the cross richard of bury chancellor of england under edward the third spurred no expense in collecting the library the first perhaps that any private man had formed yet so scarce were valuable books that he began an abbey fifty he, he, he began an abbey fifty pounds weight of silver for between thirty and forty volumes and the book of Psalms, with brief notes written in the margin was valued at a sum equal to nearly forty dollars or many more dollars today a copy of the new testament was sold for thirteen dollars a sum equal to six months income of a tradesman for about twenty five dollars were considered enough to keep a farmer or trader in those times when so few of the comforts we now we now enjoy were known but costly as was the purchase it was cheerfully paid and great was the danger of those who dared to read the word of god there were some who bravely met it. <coughs> Excuse me. Written copies of Wycliffe's Bible were eagerly sought at, by, after by those who could read, and there in, castles, in a castle some rich nobleman might have been seen with one of these written Bibles before him in, fair in, in, in wonderful characters. But though a nobleman might be found one who could read the Bible yet from the want of learning as well as books being scarce and costly there were only a small number of the people who could possess the word of God even some of the nobles and gentry could not write their names and not many of the common people were able to read perhaps not more than one in a small town or village was learned enough to read and write and we may then suppose 
What was the state of the land when the people had no gospel preached to them, and few possessed the scriptures or could pursue any book likely to be the means of doing good to their souls? England indeed had been for ages without the light that cometh from heaven. Errors and foolish rites like dark clouds were spread over the land. It was at such time that Wycliffe arose as a light in the darkness, and like the star that appeared over the fields of Bethlehem, he guided many souls to the Saviour. The numerous books he wrote were spread abroad in the same manner as his written as the written as his written Bible. He also prepared many sermons, about three hundred of which have been preserved to the present day. From these will we learn what the truths he taught the people. The priest said that human merits and suffering of penance and pilgrimage would entirely entitle them to heaven, but Wycliffe taught that sinful man could not save himself and that mercy was only to be found through faith in the blood and righteousness of Jesus. The priest asserted that images should be honoured and that there were many mediators, but the bold reformer said the worship of imagery was idolatry, that saints and angels were not to be prayed to, for there is but one mediator between God and men. And he maintained that the Church of Rome is no more the head of the churches than any other church, and that the Apostle Peter had no more power given him than any other apostle, and for all his doctrines he referred to the word of God, making that it was the only safe guide to a Christian man and woman. In many other ways he opposed the doings and teachings of the priests of the Pope and the Papal Church. Wycliffe did not quite receive all the great Bible truths in their fullness. It is a wonder that he knew so much at the time when all the land was sunk in ignorance and error, but he understood enough of the word of God to know that many of the doctrines of the Catholic Church could not be found in the Bible, and he preached so many of the true doctrines of the Bible, as well as to entitle him the honourable name, the Morning Star of the Reformation. The good parson was much beloved in his own parish, and many came from the villages around to his church that they might hear the gospel from his lips. He was the friend of all, and he was ready to teach and comfort and pray for all at all times. But thus he lived, seeking the good of souls, his enemies opposing him even to the end of his days, though God did not permit them to cast him into prison, nor to bring him to a crude death as they desired. Continued labour at length broke down his death and his health, and one day, when in church, he was seized with fatal attacks of disease and sunk to the ground. He was carried into his house where he lay speechless state for two days and then died. But though he was removed, he left behind him many disciples who carried on the good work he had begun. Though Wycliffe never left his own land to preach the truth across the seas, it was carried in almost every country of Europe by his writings, his tracts and sermons were read by many awakened minds and were the means of preparing them for a full knowledge of the gospel. As his enemies could not prevail against him while he lived, they showed their hatred of his name and doctrine after his death. When his remains had lain in the grave for, four, for 41 years, they were dug up and burned and the ashes cast into the little river Swift, which flows near the town where he laboured. Thence, as an old writer says, they passed into the great river Severn, then their onward course into the narrow seas and last into the wide ocean, and thus became the emblem of truth which should flow from the little country town over England and the world, that it shall extend from river to the ends of the earth, and we know, for the word of God declares it. My dear friends, what, what can we learn today from this man of God? We can learn this. Wycliffe was a faithful pastor. Our Lord taught the apostles to be shepherds of the flock, to comfort the flock, to feed the sheep with the finest of wheat. You as pastors today, whether you're in China or Africa or America, you have been called to feed the flock of God. You must feed the flock. You must preach the word in season, out of season. And you must not mind enemies, because there were great enemies against Wycliffe, but yet, till the end of his days, he still preached the word of God. My dear friend, if you are a preacher today, get on with your work and preach the word of God. Sound it out throughout the Europe, throughout America, and throughout the world, and proclaim the word of God. Arise, preacher, and fulfill your duty, and be a man like Wycliffe. And may God bless.